Our text today is John's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 27 to 34. The Apostle writes, At this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, imagine for a moment that you are one of the 12 disciples. You're in this pagan infested part of Israel that is despised by the Jewish people. You and the other disciples enter into the town of Sychar, this Samaritan town full of outcasts. And you find the local Samaritan deli, and you pick up some corned beef sandwiches there. And you're careful to ignore the stares of the people in town who are very curious as to why 12 Jewish guys have suddenly entered into their town and are walking through Sychar. And then, as you're walking back to your Lord with baskets full of groceries, you look up and you see Jesus having a friendly discussion with a woman. Not just with a woman, with an obviously Samaritan woman. You would be utterly shocked. What an amazing sight that had to be for the disciples. They were at least as surprised to see Jesus speaking with this woman as she herself was. Remember when Jesus first asked her for a drink. He said, give me a drink. And she said, you, a Jewish man, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? How is this possible? You see, in that time, in contemporary rabbinical etiquette, rabbis would never speak to any woman in public. This was part of the way that the early first century Jewish leadership operated. A rabbi would never speak to a woman in public. He was not even to speak to his own wife in public. That was the Jewish view, the contemporary Jewish view of how women were to be treated by men. It was below a rabbi to speak to or to teach a woman anything. One of the daily rabbinical prayers was this. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who has not made me a woman. <laughs> you think about that for a second. Wow. And that's actually one of the things that Jesus demolishes in his ministry. In the ministry of Christ... Women are greatly honored by Christ. I mean, so much so that you'll remember at the resurrection of Jesus, which we're going to be studying in just a couple of weeks, it was not the disciples who first saw the risen Jesus, but it was women, it was Mary Magdalene. Christ revealed himself to them. Because he greatly honored them. It was not 
The disciples who were standing around the cross, although John was there, but most of the disciples had run away. Who was standing around Christ's cross as Christ was dying? It was the women who were there, who were unafraid. You know, why were the disciples running away when Jesus was crucified? Because they just, I don't want this to happen to me. The Romans might get me. The Jewish leadership might see me as one of Jesus' disciples and do the same thing to me. Peter, I mean, the great Peter, even he denies Christ three times and runs away the night before Jesus was crucified. But not the women, not the women. They're there for Christ. They're walking with Christ on the road to Golgotha. And Christ honors these women. And so, so even though it was a contemporary rabbinical culture not to speak to a woman or to honor a woman, yet Jesus, the king of the Jews, he rejects that. He utterly rejects that and gives women a high place of honor in his kingdom. And he uh, uh, shows this by speaking with this woman. But they were surprised. The disciples were greatly surprised to see this. And any idea that women have lesser spiritual capacity than men or are somehow l l lesser in value than men is rejected by the Lord. In the gospel, there is neither male nor female. And we can praise God for that. Praise the Lord that he is the savior of both men and women alike. Amen. Nevertheless, the common thought in the first century was that Samaritan women in particular were considered unclean from birth. So surely the, the disciples think there has to be some reason Jesus is talking with this woman. Maybe he's asking her for directions or something. Some other mundane thing. So far from their minds was the fact that Jesus was fulfilling his mission to seek and to save the lost. Yet the text says, even though they were shocked to see Jesus talking with this Samaritan woman, they did not ask him, what do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? Why didn't they ask him that? We can only assume that they thought it would be disrespectful of them to do so. It would be disrespectful to say to Jesus, like, what are you doing, Jesus? Why are you talking with that person? By this time in Christ's ministry, they had seen enough and heard enough from Christ, even at this early point, that they think he must have a good reason for doing what he did. Albert Barnes writes here, We should be confident that Jesus is right, even if we cannot fully understand all that he does. Isn't that a good lesson for us? We don't need to ask why. We don't need to ask him why he does what he does. If the disciples themselves don't ask Jesus why he is doing something that they don't understand, then perhaps we should not ask why Either. When Christ does something in our life, maybe we don't need to say, Oh Lord, why are you doing this? And instead say, I trust you. You've proven yourself already over and over and over that you are good, that you are God, that you are all powerful, that you have my ultimate best interest at heart in anything that happens in my life. This is the reason why the Apostle Paul writes Romans 8, 28, for we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Like, why does Paul write that? Because we typically, and this is just a very short little rabbit trail, but it's important for us, I think. We typically tend to think this, when things are going good in our life, when like the sky is blue and our road is easy and there's no rocks in our path, we tend to think, God is working for my good right now, obviously. And when there's a crook in our lot, when the road turns in a way that we don't like, when there's obstacles in our path, we naturally, our tendency is to think, uh, 
Maybe God doesn't have my good at heart. Maybe he doesn't. That's why Paul writes that, to remind us of this fact. We don't even need to ever ask God why. Never. We never have to ask that question of God. We just need to submit to God's sovereign, mighty hand. Say, Lord, I don't understand why. I don't understand why. But that everything that we see that ever comes into our life is put there, actually put there by God himself for our good and for his glory. That's why he puts anything in our path. That's all we need to know, actually. That's all we need to know. So these disciples... They look at Jesus talking with this woman. They don't ask him why. He does something that they don't understand. They think, ah, it's better just to trust him. Of course, that being said, when we're wrestling with doubt and sorrow and pain, it's good for us to be honest with God, to bring that to God, to say to God, I don't understand why. I'm not going to question you, Lord. I'm not going to grumble to you, but I don't understand. We see that in the Psalms. David does that. He's honest with the Lord when he prays, especially when we see him working in strange ways. But this must always be the sure footing upon which we stand and what must underpin our thoughts about God. Namely, everything that the Lord does, he does with purpose. You know that? Everything he does, he does with purpose. That's why they don't ask him, why are you doing this? And everything that he does is good. And everything that he does ultimately brings glory and good to, glory to himself and good for us. He always works for the love of his redeemed. And his ways and his thoughts are as far above our ways and our thoughts as the heavens are above the earth. So if we keep that in mind, we never have to ask why. Look at verses 28 to 30. So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I've done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and they were coming to him. You remember what the last thing was that this woman said to Jesus? She said, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will explain all things to us. We learned about that last week. And Jesus replied and said to her, I who speak to you am he. Actually, in the Greek, it doesn't even say he. It says, I who speak to you, I am. Wow, it's pretty amazing. So Christ confesses that he is the one whom she is referring to. He is the promised Messiah that had been prophesied up until that point for 4,000 years. He meets that woman at Jacob's well and reveals his identity to her in such a spectacular way. Confessing who he is, his identity to this woman prior to. He had not confessed his identity like that. To Nicodemus, or or even to the disciples. They did not even ask him. You think about that. It's far later when Jesus has to ask them, Who do you say I am? Some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say one of the prophets. Jesus says, Who do you say I am? Peter says, You are the Ah, then he confesses it. But it's much later on. Jesus reveals himself to this woman. Seems that it was at just this exchange as Jesus is revealing his divine identity, his identity as the Messiah of Israel, when the disciples were walking up. And the Samaritan woman has this amazing reaction to Jesus' confession of his own Messiahship. What's the first thing that she does? Look at verse 28. 
So the woman left her water pot. She left it there. Why did she go to the well in the first place? What was the reason why she was there? You remember why? Because she's thirsty. That's why she has to go to this place all the time, lugging this heavy jar. You know, I, I took some friends. I said this, I've said this like 10 times now, sometimes from the pulpit, sometimes at book club, but I'm going to say it now, and then we're going to do it then, all right? I think we all need to take a, a, a trip, a, a field trip. On Monday afternoon, we need to go to the Oriental Institute Museum, okay? And the University of Chicago, all of us will all go. We'll take big van, okay? I'll, I'll rent a bus and we'll all get on it or something, or drive it separate, whatever. And you can see there at that museum what these water pots look like. They're there, they're sitting there at the museum. It's a big jar. Like, for me, I'm not a super strong man, but, but I mean, it, it would be heavy for me to carry a jar, to carry a bucket with a rope, a long rope, because the well is deep. And then you carry this all the way out of the city, all the way to Jacob's well, and then lower the bucket and raise the bucket and fill the jar. You know, it's, what is it, eight pounds per gallon? Eight pounds per gallon. That's, that's how much a gallon of water weighs. And what's eight times three? 24? So you think about that for a second. Let's just say she has a three gallon, which is not a lot of water, to bathe, to drink, to use during the day. That's at least 25 pounds that she's carrying. And she's carrying it all the way from her house to there and then heavier from there back to her house. Why? Because she's so thirsty, that's why. She's going there thirsty. And Jesus says to her, if you would ask me, I would give you living water and you'll never be thirsty again. And what does she say to him? Sir, give me this living water so that I don't have to keep coming here to the well to draw water. That's what she says. And then Jesus gives it to her. Go call your husband. The first, the first sip of living water. Conviction of sin. And then they have a conversation about sacrifice and worship. And then she says, I know Messiah is coming. And then Jesus says, I who speak to you, I am he. And as soon as she receives that confession of Christ, she leaves her water jar there. Why does she leave it? Because she, what does Jesus say happens when he gives the living water to someone? It becomes a well of water springing up to eternal life. They're never thirsty again. She leaves that jar there because suddenly her mind is no longer on earthly things. She's so thirsty. She's not thirsty anymore. She leaves her jar there, runs back to the city. Come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. He told me even all about my sin. He told me about what true worship is. He told me that he's the Messiah. Come meet this man. That's all she says. Getting ahead of myself. She leaves her jar there because the living water had already taken effect in the Samaritan woman's soul. Her thirst was quenched by Jesus Christ. She runs into the city and what is the first thing that happens as soon as she runs into the city? She becomes a spring of water. That's it. The life-giving water of Christ welling up within her it cannot help but come out of her mouth. Come meet Jesus. She's like a, she's like a, a, a spring. It's coming out of her now. It's so amazing. She says, is this not the Christ? 
She's convicted that indeed he is. And she has to tell the whole town about him. That's the first thing that happens when this woman drinks of the living water of Jesus, she instantly becomes a witness of Jesus' grace in her life. Friends, if that's happened, if you've drunk of the living water of Christ, isn't that the first thing that happened with you as well? Like, if you can remember the time when, when Christ first revealed himself to you, when he first showed you who he really is, when he gave you eternal life, like what is the first thing that you did? I bet you, you went and told somebody. <laughs> I bet you, you did. You went and told somebody, I believe in Jesus now. No, look, it's right here. This was the verse that turned my heart to him. I see it. Do you see it too? Could this be the Christ? That's the effect of what the living water is. That's what Jesus exactly says is going to happen to her. He who drinks of this water becomes a well of water springing up to eternal life. And she has to tell the whole town about him. See, before, like, why did she come to the well alone? I know we're reading the white spaces of the text, and the text doesn't exactly say it, but from the context, usually in first century Israel, in the ancient Near East time, women would walk there together to the well. They would help each other. They would uh, be there together so that one of them wasn't assaulted on the road. They didn't have neighborhood watch. They didn't have police at that time. The women would have to go there together to protect each other. They'd usually go before the sunrise while it's still dark. Why? Because it's so hot. But here this woman comes alone. Alone. She has no friends. Because when she would pass by the doors of her former friends' houses, they'd close the shutters and hide their husbands. She's had five husbands. And the man that she's with now is not her husband. Yet for all of that shame, suddenly all of that is gone. It's gone. She's a bold witness now. She goes to the gate of the city. She says to the men, Come meet this man! He's changed my life. He's changed my life. He can change your life. How quickly this living water takes effect in the Samaritan woman's soul. She left the city that afternoon thirsty, and she returns gushing with living water. She was ashamed and alone. Now she returns boldly confessing her own sin, giving witness to Christ's divine knowledge of her, proclaiming his messiahship. What a profound change occurred in such a short time as the time that she spent with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a profound change. And it takes place so quickly. So quickly. The Samaritan woman suddenly becomes a, a witness to others of the grace of God in her life. And she stands even to this day, even 2,000 years after she lived. She stands to this day as a mighty monument of the grace of God. How many people over the course of the 2,000 years of church history can trace this story of Jesus' grace to this woman to their own salvation. Ah, oh, if he could have mercy and grace on someone like that, he can have mercy and grace on me. Oh, I would wager that there's going to be many, many thousands, millions maybe, of people in the kingdom of heaven who were converted by this account, by this account, actually. She's a monument of grace. How marvelous is it that we don't even know her name and we're talking about her 2,000 years after she lived. That's incredible. It's true. No one's going to know me 2,000 years from now. That's for sure. We're talking about this woman 2,000 years later. This recipient of God's love and grace so long ago and so far away from where she received the grace 
I mean, on the, we're on the other side of the earth from where this took place. Isn't that amazing, too? We're on the other side of the earth from where this conversation took place. And it still has the power to change our life as well. Notice that she mentions the Christ. Could this be the Christ? It seems to indicate that even these people in this far dark corner, this, 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 this forsaken area of a forsaken people, even they had some notion that the Christ was coming. Uh, they, they didn't say, oh, who? Like, who are you talking about? Like, no, 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 no. They had an expectation. She mentions the Christ, and they listen to her. Listen, even in places where we might think there's no one there that longs for Jesus, there's no one whose heart is being prepared by the Holy Spirit to receive him. There can't be anyone like that in this area. We're wrong about that. We're wrong about that. Jesus, in the very next section, Lord willing, when, when we get to the very next section here in John's Gospel, he tells his disciples that the, the fields are ripe for harvest. That he has been preparing a people to receive him. Her testimony must have been so powerful to the people of her town. I mean, otherwise, they would have ignored her. Remember, look at what it says in verse 28. So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men of the city. So here's a woman and she's giving her testimony to the men of the city. Women, as I said, were not usually taken seriously in that place and time. So her words were very persuasive. She must have been extremely loud. Otherwise, they would not have heard her. She must have said, listen, listen, I met the Messiah. You need to come and see him. He's at the well sitting there right now. And what was their response when she says that? Calm down, Susie. Was that what they said? No, no, they didn't. What are you babbling on about? No, they didn't say that. Instead, what did they do? It says they went out of the city and they were coming to him. Jesus says to another woman whose sins were many, he who is forgiven much loves much. The reason that the Samaritan woman's testimony was so powerful was because she was such a great monument of God's grace. She knew, she knew that her sins were many. She knew that she didn't deserve to meet the Messiah and to receive living water from him. She knew that he could have turned his back on such a fornicator and an adulterer, but instead he doesn't do that. He saves her. He pours out his grace upon her. And that grace was not without effect. You know, that's what the Apostle Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He says, I don't deserve to be an apostle. I per persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. What I am. Do you know I was just this week at my favorite coffee bar that I go to like every day. And there's a relatively a new girl barista behind the, the, the counter. And I saw that on her forearm she had this tattoo. By the grace of God I am what I am. That's what it said on there. And I said I walked up to her when I was ordering. I, I ordered my favorite miel, which is like coffee with honey in it and milk. It's delicious. And, and I said to her, I like, I like that verse. And she said, uh, oh yeah, yeah, so do I. She said something to the effect of like, I don't really even know what it means. <laughs> but I like it. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And I said to her, what it means is this, the Apostle Paul said, by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace 
to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. That's the context of the passage that's on your arm. And what it means is this, that because the Apostle Paul was a first century Osama bin Laden, that's what he was. He's a terrorist. He's going to persecute Christians, to throw them into jail. He wants what happened to Stephen to happen to all Christians. He wants them all to be stoned to death. He's Osama bin Laden. And then as he's on the road to go and carry out his wicked plans to destroy the church in Damascus, there Jesus meets him, knocks him to the ground, says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? It is I, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and go and I'll show you what you need to do. And Jesus had grace on him. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that his grace, his grace was not without an effect. The effect of God's grace to Paul was, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but Christ in me. Like, why did he work harder than all of them? Because of what I said about that sinful woman. He who is forgiven much loves much. We will love God and we will serve God commensurate with how much we understand we have been forgiven by God. If we think we have very little to be forgiven for, we will then love God very little. If I think I'm not that big of a sinner, I'm going to love God very little because what has Christ done for me? Hey, he's just helped me out a little bit. It's not that bad. I, you know, like, eh. But if I realize that my sins are Mount Everest, that's what my sins are. I have Mount Everest of sin. And that that is what Christ has actually done for me, is that he's taken my sin from me. He's died on the cross to forgive me. Then his grace will have that much of a greater effect upon me. He who is forgiven much loves much. He who is forgiven little loves little. When this woman goes to the town and she says, come meet Jesus, she does so because she realizes how much Jesus has forgiven her. That's why she does that. That's why she becomes such a bold witness. That's why she's uh, not afraid to uh, uh, confess. He told me everything I ever did. That's why. And so she knew that she had to tell everybody about Jesus. His grace energized her and propelled her as a redeemed sinner to share the living water with her countrymen. And what did they do? They came to Jesus at first because of her testimony. Now, I want to cover this more the next time we study this passage. But suffice it to say for now, the only reason the Samaritan woman possessed this boldness and this fearlessness to share Christ with her people is because the well of water was springing up to eternal life within her. Hallelujah. What a Savior we have. In the next verses, we see something truly remarkable that occurs within Jesus himself after the exchange with this woman. And then we'll finish with this. Look at verses 31 to 34. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying... Rabbi, eat. <laughs> I, I just had to stop here and say, when I read this verse, I think about my Jewish grandma. Because that's, that's how she always taught. What are you doing? You need to eat something. You don't know what it's like to stand in line for hours waiting for food. Eat, eat. Right? <laughs> it's got to, for thousands of years, it hasn't changed. It's been the same. They say, they say, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Remember why Jesus sat down by the well in the first place. Text tells us because he was weary. He's tired. He hadn't had anything to eat. He's an actual, real human being. He needs food. 
Okay? He's also thirsty. He says to the woman, give me a drink. Which, you know, <laughs> shockingly, the Bible doesn't actually say that she ever gives him a drink. All right? Jesus asks her for a drink, but she doesn't give it to him. She should have, like, okay, Lord, let me give you. you. You've given me living water. Let me at least give you a drink right now. She doesn't even do that. He's weary from the journey. He, it was hot. He was thirsty. They didn't have food. The disciples go into the city of Sychar in order to get food, to buy food. So they see Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman suddenly runs off. They don't ask him why um, he was talking with her, but they urge him to eat. All right. And then Jesus says, I have food to eat that you do not know about. They think, huh, did the woman make him a sandwich? Like, is that the food? Surely no one brought him something to eat. No, no. Listen, the living water is spiritual water. And here Jesus is referring to spiritual food. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. His disciples were concerned about physical bread, but Jesus' thoughts were higher than their thoughts. The sweetness of the heavenly conference Jesus had with the Samaritan woman eliminated Christ's own weariness. It eliminated his hunger and it filled him with spiritual food. Listen, friends, has that ever happened to you before? Have you ever been in spiritual conversation with someone and hours may go by? Hours go by and you have no thought whatsoever of like food or going to the bathroom or drinking anything. Like why? Because to do the will of God is spiritual food. It satisfies us. It takes our mind off of the earth and onto higher things, onto heaven. Look at this incredible thing. The woman was thirsty, but she leaves the jar at the well. Jesus was hungry, but he doesn't eat. Why? Because their minds were set on heaven. That's why. The woman forgot about her thirst because she now possessed living water. Jesus forgot about his hunger and about his weariness, because his food is to do the will of him who sent him and to accomplish his work. We see here just a couple of really beautiful truths. I'll end with this. First, this is an amazing thing here I'm about to tell you right now. Jesus is satisfied and rejoices in saving sinners. That brings Jesus satisfaction. Even to this day, that brings Jesus satisfaction. He calls that exchange with the Samaritan woman his food. Even his physical weariness is gone as he does his father's will. He says in Luke 15, 10, I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who Repents. There's rejoicing in heaven. Celebration. Zephaniah 3.17 The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. That's talking about God. That says God rejoices. We don't typically think about that, right? About God rejoicing? God uh, experiencing? Like that kind of joy and emotion? But he does. This is the reason why Jesus endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him. Well, the joy of what? Because he knew what the cross was going to accomplish. That's why he was joyful, joyful even as he's going toward it, toward the worst possible death none of us can even imagine in this room, the worst possible death possible, okay? 
the most awful, horrible way to die. Not only that, but also bearing the wrath of God for the sin of the world. Jesus is about to bear that. And yet the Bible says it's for the joy that is set before him that he endures all of that. Because he knows that his death on the cross is going to accomplish salvation and that brings him joy. It brings him joy. That's why Jesus was satisfied in this moment. That's why he's no longer hungry. Because he's rejoicing. And second... He says that the salvation of the Samaritan woman was the will of God and the work of God. That's what it is. 1 Timothy 1, 15 to 16. This is, this is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost... Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. That's what Paul says. That God saved him to make him an example for those who would believe through him. Couldn't the Samaritan woman say the exact same thing? Exactly. Can't you and I? Can't you and I say the same thing? Oh, I am the chief of sinners, yet Christ had mercy on me in order to make me a monument of his grace. Hallelujah. That's so beautiful. These are things that are worthy of meditating on, all right? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That's the blessed man. Let us, let us chew on these things and meditate on them. How what Christ did for this Samaritan woman actually brought him satisfaction, filled him filled Christ with spiritual food. He's rejoicing over one sinner who is saved. And that sinner then filled with living water becomes a spring of water, speaks just a few words to her townspeople. Come meet the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they come to him. They come to him. Let her life and the grace of God in this woman be an example for us of what the effect of God's grace should be in our lives. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, our great and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this amazing example of your grace to the Samaritan woman. It was spiritual food for you, Lord, to give eternal life to this Samaritan woman. Oh, fill us with spiritual food today. May we be about our Father's work as well, just as you were. That this was why you came into the world, to save sinners. Let us be mouthpieces for you let us speak about what you have done in our lives. Open up our mouths to be your witnesses just as you did for this Samaritan woman. Just as you opened up her mouth and she was bold to her countrymen. No longer shameful or hiding her face. She went to them and shared the gospel. Let us do the same. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray.